Good morning. My name is Joe Leach and uh, I, I lead the eldership team that oversees and cares for the people who make up Grace Church. And uh, I don't know if you would describe yourself as competitive as a person. Now, I wouldn't have actually, I wouldn't have historically called myself or referred to myself as competitive, but I do now just because lots of people have told me that I am, really. And, um, and I think I, I probably have come to realise that I am. What, what that means is that I naturally want other people to lose because I want to win. Now, I know that if some people hear that, you can think, oh, that is funny or like outrageous. I don't understand how anyone can not be that way. I, I don't understand how anyone, anyone can not want to win. So don't, you know, take it personally. If ever I want to beat you at anything or like it's not, it's nothing personal. I just want to beat everyone. Um, we, I, I like to play board games. My wife Liz and I, we like to play board games. We have kind of realised that we can kind of think, oh, let's do this for a nice evening together. It's not always the most romantic thing because, you know, what I just said. Um, and actually Liz can get a bit competitive too. And so, it's, you know, we just end up being annoyed at each other and wanting the other person to lose. But I think being, okay, being competitive in itself is okay. I think, isn't it? I, yeah, I think it's okay. It's when it comes into other areas of my life that I appreciate sometimes it's not. So it's not like I'm just competitive with this, but not that. I, I, I find myself being competitive. That's my default situation. So that can come into things like my leadership responsibilities. That's when it becomes not okay. You know, when you remember that being competitive means that I want to win and I want other people to lose. So it means that when I can, I, sometimes if, if I hear of other churches growing and seeing loads of gospel fruit, I should be exclusively happy. I mean, that is what I pray for, it's what I, I, I long for, but I have to send, fight off, like on some level, a sense of envy and disappointment that it's not happening to me. Now the good thing, and this really is a good thing, is that I am, and have become increasingly, I think, at least to some degree, self-aware of this. And I am very aware that it's not a good thing. So my Monopoly or Settlers of Catan, I think that should be self-promoting and so should yours. I want to win and so should you. But my leadership should not be self-promoting and neither should yours. We're preaching through uh, and have been through this year through the book of Exodus. And we come this morning to an interesting story which has a lot to teach us about leadership, specifically godly leadership. This morning will be a little bit different as, as to other preachers in this series, but I think there's some helpful stuff here. Um, it, it'd be different really in, in the approach that I take to, to, to teaching and preaching, probably be a little bit more thematic through this passage, looking at this passage and asking, what does it have to teach us about godly leadership? And you can decide for yourself, for yourself where, where you are in leadership and where you are not in leadership, what positions of leadership you have or, or don't have, and maybe where you want to be and how this will be applicable in that sense. That's both inside the church, and certainly this will be mostly relevant, relevant in that context where leadership certainly should be godly, but also any positions of leadership outside or ex areas where you're leading any one or anything outside of the church, where certainly Christians should still be godly in their leadership. And even if you're not in any leadership position, and I'll leave you to decide if you are, it, it will be helpful for you and everyone else to know godly leadership when you see it and so that you can see it in others and you can hold others like myself and others to it, hold, hold us to what grace church, uh, godly leadership is. What we'll see is this, that godly leadership is humble and plural and preaches the gospel. Godly leadership is humble and plural and preaches the gospel. We're in Exodus chapter 18, which is almost like a hinge point in the story. We finished the Exodus story, really, in terms of the coming out of slavery 
and are coming into the Sinai moment in the story, the, where the law is given. And this story in chapter 18 is, is the story that kind of connects the two halves of the narrative of the book of Exodus. So we'll read Exodus 18, we'll read from verse 5. It says, Joseph, uh, I'm mixing up Jethro and Moses. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with, with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with the, all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why, why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men and who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide for themselves, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way and Jethro returned to his own country. Godly leadership is humble and plural and preaches the gospel. We need to be cautious as, uh, as we look at this passage and ask what it teaches us about godly leadership. We need to be aware that this is a specific context. So what I'm saying is that we can't just say whatever they said and whatever they did with regards to leadership, therefore all leaders everywhere should do exactly that. So for example, I'm not going to say, it wouldn't be right to say that every leadership structure should be structured to have officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens precisely, just as they have. But we can look at principles that are introduced here that are consistent with the rest of scripture and learn from them. So we can learn something about the value, the principle of plurality and teams from this and what the rest of the Bible has to say. So we see here that godly leadership is humble and plural and preaches the gospel. And crucially, all of that is consistent with the rest of scripture to the extent that we can say that that much is true of all godly leadership everywhere. So godly leadership is humble. If you take Moses to be uh, the person who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which I, like Jesus, largely do, then 
Then Numbers 12 verse 3 is one of the funniest verses in the Bible, which says, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Now, I think Moses largely wrote the Pentateuch. I think there was a, the scribes involved. I think probably that was a scribe and not Moses who was writing that, um, calling himself the most humble man ever. And I think it was true that Moses was more humble than anyone else because, you know, the Bible says it. And also we see it in this passage. Think about who Moses is. If anyone on earth has the right to, you know, Ron Burgundy, I'm kind of a big deal. It, it is Moses. It is this guy. He is the man who is, he, he met with God at the mountain, burning bush, all of that. Then God used him, worked in his life. He took on Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the powerful, powerful Pharaoh. Moses took him on man to man. And with God's, obviously God using him, he won. He beat Pharaoh. He then parted the Red Sea. He, he, the Israelites won a battle because Moses kept his hands in the air because people helped him. He was in charge of uh, two to three million people, probably. It's a big deal. But he is humble to, to a crazy degree. He's amazingly humble in this passage. He's humble, firstly, just in the way he greets his father-in-law with real respect. And then there's this amazing story of Jethro hearing about it, getting saved. We'll hear about, I'll talk about that a bit later. But so Jethro's just kind of got saved, really. The next day, this, this new believer, his father-in-law, wants to see Moses at work and, uh, and he kind of comes along and watches him and he brings this serious challenge. does it in a really gracious way. He graciously asks a question in verse 14. He says, when, when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing, he said, what is this you're doing? Why do you alone sit as judge? Kind of just clarifying and then pretty bluntly says, this ain't good. This is not good. Now, if someone becomes a Christian one Sunday, then comes in, you know, comes into my office the next day and just kind of asks a few questions about the way I'm doing things and, and then says, what you're doing is not good. I'm going to struggle <laughs> to take that well. But Moses listens and takes the advice of Jethro. Even that personal cost to his own profile and status, it is incredible, incredible humility that, that shows Moses' character here. How a leader responds to questions and challenge is a huge indicator of humility. Do, do they ask questions? Do they ask questions back? Maybe get defensive and attack back maybe they kind of does a leader go into a shell and give up well fine then how do you respond you know to to, to being questioned to being challenged on such things it's, it's not exactly the same thing as humility but I think the best indicator of being humble is being teachable are you open to instruction is someone teachable godly leadership is teachable. Those who are not teachable, however skilled or gifted, to put the more Christian word on it, it, those who are not teachable, however skilled they are, they are difficult. It is hard to help those who don't want help. Teachable leaders are a joy to work with. Many of you will know this. It is so easy for teachable leaders to just grow and grow and grow. Moses at this point is 80 years old and yet he is open to instruction. He's not saying, no, it's too late for me. I'm set in my ways. He's open to, to, to changing. Part of my own story is um, I did a course a couple of years ago, beginning of 2021, uh, which I was pretty skeptical about doing this course. But, but God graciously and kind of painfully through this, it exposed some of the pride in my heart and, and the dangerous side effects of my competitive default. 
And the first step in those things is, is to recognize this, right? To, to just acknowledge where there is pride, to know where we are vulnerable. And um, some things that I, I wrote down, I kind of had to like really just think about where you're at, where are you, what can you struggle with, what are some of the unhelpful thought patterns that you might be, um, you might default towards. I, I, I wrote these things down. I've already said this, but, but I wrote, everything is a competition and winning is all that matters. That's some of the things that I had believed on some level. I wrote, I can't be satisfied by just knowing God more. I want success as well. On some level, I was believing that. Believing that it's not enough to just know God. I want, I want to succeed. That is a dangerous way to do it. And God was graciously working in my heart. I'm not fixed. I think I'm better. Because, I mean, the, it's helpful to, to acknowledge these things, these vulnerable areas. Humility is both, I think, the hardest trait for a leader to maintain and the most important trait for a leader to maintain. And sadly, lots of Christian leaders have been making a right mess in recent years. It's been difficult, I've struggled with it, it's hard. And, and limited humility seems to be the consistent thread when, when Christian leaders make a mess of things. And the more successful a leader is, the harder it is to be humble and the more humility they need. If you want to be a godly leader, be humble and teachable. At least try to be. <laughs> That's what it is. At least try to be. And if you want to be shaped by a leader as well, if you're being shaped by a leader, make sure that they are at least trying to be humble and teachable. Fundamentally, character, not skill set or gift set is the main thing when it comes to godly leadership we see that in verse 21 uh, uh, what what jethro says in, in in order that moses should do he says select capable men from all the people men and then the qualifications men who fear god trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain the, these are character traits yeah they need to be capable but the qualifications listed are about character fear god more than man the, these leaders should fear god care what god thinks about them they should be trustworthy they should hate dishonest gain uh, it is much easier to teach skills than it is character than it is to teach these things character development is slow it's taken Moses 40 to 80 years to get here. It takes discipline, which is not easy or nice. But the, the only real shortcut, if there is one, is suffering, which is less easy and less nice. Don't mishear me. Uh, capability matters. I, I would hold to that. And it, it's rubbish for everyone when we try and operate outside of our gift set or our skill set. But, but character and humility is more important. I need to be clear as well, talking about godly leadership, I need to be clear in all of this that leadership is not the goal. We can talk like everyone is a potential leader. I'm not, I'm not convinced by that. One reason is because it implies that everyone should seek after leadership, as if that's the thing that we should all be going after. Leadership is not the goal. Faithfulness is the goal. That's for a leader and for a follower, for, for everyone. Leadership is not the goal. Faithfulness is. Here it is for everyone. In the, in the New Testament, Peter has been talking to elders in 1 Peter, and, and then he says in, in chapter 5, verse 5, he says, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's for all of us. Clothe yourself in humility. Let it cover you. Clothe yourself in humility cast your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. 
Give your anxiety to him. Clothe yourself with humility. It's true for everyone. It is certainly true for leaders. It is much better to be lifted up by God than it is to try to lift yourself up. Because here's the thing in, in all of this. Here's the thing. It's not about you. But it is about someone. The, the point is to lead people to Jesus, not yourself. That's why godly leadership is, is humble. One thing that God revealed to me as I did that course is that I can be tempted to think that the end goal is success and knowing God better is a means to getting there. So yeah, I'll pray and I'll do this and that for God because that might make me more effective, more productive or fruitful. <laughs> Rather than what is true, that success is only ever a means to knowing God more. That is the real end goal. In church context, that's true and explicit. It's true in any other context as well. That good and godly leadership is humble. And godly leadership is plural. The problem that Jethro identifies is that Moses is doing too much. I don't know if he is a control freak or if he just kind of landed himself in this way, Moses, but it's not sustainable and it's not good. And the solution that Jethro gives is to make teams, pluralize the leadership, give away authority, he says. And again, this remarkable humility that Moses listens and does what he's told. Humility and plurality go hand in hand. They're, they're lovers. They go together. There's loads of reasons to delegate responsibility. And there's loads of reasons not to. We want control. We want profile. Yeah, sure, we're busy, but what great a badge of honour is there than being busy today? And we think we're the best of it. We, we're worried that someone else, they'll do a subpar job. We're worried they'll mess it up. They'll do it differently. And we probably are the best at it because we've been doing it and they will need to learn it. They almost certainly will do a less good job initially, but they will grow. And they certainly will do things differently, and that's good. That, increase, that increases creativity and diversity. The secular world knows this. The Bible knows this. It's clear that it is needed. It's clear, and it works. Verse 23, uh, Jethro says, If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. It will be sustainable for Moses, and everyone else will be happy. And this principle is clear throughout Scripture. Certainly in the New Testament, Jesus chooses multiple disciples. And even he sends the disciples out in twos. He appointed 72. There's a team of apostles. There's church planters working in teams. There's a team of elders, team of deacons and deaconesses. The church is one body of many parts. It goes on and on. And so everything in Grace Church is built around teams because godly leadership is plural worship teams kids team site teams youth team eldership team tea and coffee team pa team little bears team the, the don't be offended if i haven't mentioned your team the, these teams have leaders but godly leadership is plural and uh, probably the closest link to what is happening in exodus 18 is that we have life groups with life group leaders it would not be possible and it would not be right for me or for the elders to directly care for everyone. So life group leaders look out for people and are there to support and love and care and disciple. And I and we, we do what we can to support the leaders. We lead and work in team. We, uh, we can often struggle because we, we might think, well, there just isn't anyone. That, that you know, there's not, there's not anyone about. I can't appoint, I can't delegate because there's no one to do it. John Mackay is helpful in, in his commentary. He says, In all probability, the difficulty is not in finding those to whom the duties may be assigned, but in a leader being prepared to take the risk of entrusting important tasks to others. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5, having, having just talked about humility says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now, it is possible to go too far with this, where 
where we start trying to operate out of a, a kind of pseudo or false humility. So it would not be right for Moses in this story to say that he wants out completely. That he says, oh, I'm done. No, I, I don't want to do anything. If you're going to take the responsibility, then just take it. It's right that he delegates and it's right that he stays in his role because God has called him to that role. If, if God calls us to something and we say no, we can maybe call it humility, but it doesn't mean it necessarily is. It might be lack of faith. It might be a laziness. There's a difference between delegation and dodging and delegating a task and dodging what God is calling us to. Oh, I can be a control freak, but I'm not generally predisposed that way. Um, mostly it's not that hard for me to delegate, but I might be vulnerable to, to dodging something occasionally. So it might be that I can delegate a task, but actually I know God well, really is something that God has called me to do, but I just don't want to, so I delegate because Godly leadership is plural. But really, I'm just dodging God's call. Maybe there's something God is, is calling you into. It's not humility when God calls you to something. It's not humble to say no. That, that's just not, that's dodging the call of God. Now, certainly, get support in it. Work in teams and, and hum, be humble in it. But, but heed God's call on your life. Godly leadership is plural. And here's the thing, again, it's not about you, but it is about someone. That there's only room for one individual who gets glory and honour and one saviour, one Lord. We, there's something in us, we want to put people on a platform. We, individualism is, is in us, we want to, to celebrate celebrities, but there is only room ultimately for one God. Godly leadership points to God and, and good leadership, whether that is in a church context or any other context, should always be looking to build team and to multiply. And godly leadership preaches the gospel. We've talked a lot in this preaching series and I do, do catch up with it. It's all online um, through Exodus of how this Exodus story is a picture. It's a pre-telling of the Christian story of salvation. And at the beginning of chapter 18 in, in Exodus, as we've read, the, the first thing that happens before all of the rest is that Moses preaches the gospel. He tells the good news to Jethro. Now, Jethro was not an, not an Israelite. It says in, in verse 1, he is a priest of Midian. He's a Midianite. And Moses... As a godly leader, the first thing on his mind when he meets Jethro is that he wants to tell him about God and help him to put his faith and his trust into Yahweh, the God of Israel. He says in verse 8, uh, Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. He, he, he's told him, Moses told Jethro the whole story, probably painted it all. We, we're in bitter slavery, 400 years in slavery, got worse and worse. And then God raised up Moses. God sent 10 plagues and gnats and, and locusts. And, and then the plague of the firstborn and this Passover lamb. And they were saved because they had the blood of the lamb on their door frame and 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 then they finally got out of Egypt but then they were stuck between a sea and an army and God brought them through the sea he parted the sea it might have been that Moses would have, would have sung Exodus 15 to Jethro sung this song of worship of how God threw the horses and chariots into the sea and but then carries on in in, in the wilderness that, that they're in the wilderness but God has provided this amazing manner thing to, to sustain them and then they were, had a battle with the Amalekites but God saved them when Moses was able to keep his arms in the air tells this whole story he preaches the gospel to Jethro 
And then it says in, in verse 10, 11, Jethro says, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians under Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. Moses tells him the story, preaches the gospel and Jethro gets saved. Jethro puts his faith and his trust in God. And it is so clear from everything. There is no way that that story can be told in any way for Moses to say, hey, yeah, we, we escaped. We got out. We, we got us. We were slaves and we set ourselves free. He tells it very clearly. God set us free. And Jethro is very clear. God, praise be to the Lord who has rescued you. Very clearly it is God brought out the, the Israelites. And today we tell our story. We, we, we tell our story as we preach the gospel. But just as the Israelite story is not really about the Israelites, our story is not really about us. And for, for all of us, for every Christian. Now, obviously, some of the details differ in our stories, but the main bits are the same. What's my, my story is that I was lost in sin. I was, I was subject to death. I was without God and without hope, trapped in slavery. I had no hope in my life. But Jesus chose to take my sin, to take my rebellion, took that on himself, and he died on a cross for, for me. He took my sin and died and paid and took the punishment that I deserved. And then he rose again. He beat death. He conquered sin and death. Jesus has set me free. And now I'm not a slave, but I'm free in Jesus, free to live for him. Israel's story, you, you see, is, is not about Israel. My story is not about me. And, and that is something that I think generally we understand more and more the longer we're Christians, the longer we realise, oh, I didn't, I didn't save myself. I didn't seek after God, did I? He really, he saved me. And godly leadership never stops going on about this. Godly leadership never stops preaching the gospel. It's not, it's not that we start with the gospel of God saving us. Here's the story, yeah, we're saved. And then we kind of move on to the proper stuff. Let's preach some other stuff now. We never move on from the gospel. It's... It, Paul sums it up in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses 2 to 5. And again, humility running through it. He says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. The whole time, Paul was with the Corinthians. He, he, he said, I, I, I'm just going to preach the gospel. I'm going to resolve, I'm, I'll know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We, godly preaching never stops preaching the gospel. That's to unbelievers like Jethro. The, the gospel's what they need. We declare the grace of God. We preach the gospel to unbelievers. And it's to believers like Israel. The gospel is what they need. Need time and time and time time and time again reminded what God has done for them. I also quite, I like what, what Paul said, so that I, I think I'll agree. When my preaching is not wise or persuasive, it's, it's because I want your faith to rest on God's power and not on, not on human wisdom. That, that's exactly. So if you find everything today has been rubbish, I, I've done that on purpose because I want you to rely on God's power and not human wisdom. Obviously, Godly leadership preaching the gospel is, is most clear and obvious for leaders in a church context. We should be eager and, and clear up front that we are preaching Christ and him crucified. But all godly leadership preaches the gospel, to some extent at least. Moses is told in verse 20, one of the things is to teach the decrees and instructions and to show them how they are to live. To, to live up to it, model this message, model Jesus. All godly leadership models Christ. Live, teach and lead following his example. Be his ambassador, his representative. People look at what a leader looks at. So you see a leader looking at something you will follow. 
their gaze. Leaders, look at Jesus and hope and pray that others will follow your gaze and see him too. See Jesus, not you, but Christ and him crucified. Godly leadership is humble and plural and preaches the gospel because it's not about you. It's not about me, but it is about someone. It's about the one who saved us. Our leadership, just as our lives, should be all about making much of Jesus. Probably no better leadership statement ever said than what John the Baptist in, in John 3 verse 30, he must become greater, I must become less. That's godly leadership. Godly leadership and just godly lead, godliness is, is about looking to Jesus. He saved us out of slavery and death and into life and freedom and joy. He is worthy of our lives. It is all about him.